it's amazing that we got to 40 years of WrestleMania, and much as I'm digging the two-night format, some of the matches that took place this weekend could have been taken off the card because they felt too much like filler and didn't get executed well. Then the remaining eight to nine matches could have made for the perfect one-night WrestleMania. I'm just saying, if we're gonna have two nights, don't make any match feel like filler. Then. Nice new intro with Triple H being the narrator. We truly are in the Paul Levesque era now, and I'm so excited to see what the future holds come WrestleMania 41. This will be the last time I mention it because it looks like this is going to be a normal thing going forward. But I am not a fan of WWE welcoming us to the premium live event and then doing a video package just to re-welcome us back to the event we were welcomed to three minutes ago. It just doesn't have the same feel. This is WrestleMania! I'm about to repeat that same statement in about three minutes. See how annoying that sounds? Straight up cold breakers. Chris Jericho is returning to WWE confirm? Nah, I'm just kidding. Not yet. Coming soon, but not just yet. You'll see, soon enough. The biggest WrestleMania of all time. This WrestleMania is the biggest of all time, despite the fact that we say that every single year and come up short most of the time, and the only way for it to be the biggest of all time is by giving every match an epic moment and execute everything perfectly. In other words, that's not going to be the case tonight, cliche. If you're going to re-welcome us to WrestleMania for the second time tonight, at least execute some pyrotechnics. It's a lot less bright outside compared to WrestleMania 35 when there was opening pyro. I can make an exception for last year because it was 5 p.m. over in Los Angeles, but it's nearly dark outside tonight. Give us Pyro at WrestleMania. Why are you showing us the wrestlers before they make their entrance with their custom outfits? The beauty of the entrance at WrestleMania is we get to see them wearing the new outfits as they're introduced. When Becky Lynch walks out to the stage, it isn't going to have the same impact. Although I'm taking off a sin for Becky Lynch being a complete badass, she was dealing with a severe strep infection and a fever over 102 degrees and still put on a great match with Rhea Ripley for the Women's World Championship. Admiring the dedication here. I'm singing our national anthem. Too late, we've already been welcomed to WrestleMania twice tonight and the wrestlers for the opening match are ready to go. With all due respect, they should have kept the singing of the national anthem in their usual place before we're ever welcomed to the show, much less welcomed twice. Gotta love how Triple H extending his arms out is his way of saying I run this shit and we all feel good about that too. To have Michael Cole, Corey Graves, and Pat McAfee call in the action for both nights of WrestleMania 40 is a double win to me. Double sin remover. Yes, I know there's three of them, but I'm not talking about that. I respect that Becky Lynch has a brand new book and I'm going to read it someday, but it doesn't really work as a WrestleMania entrance, especially when compared to Rhea Ripley's upcoming entrance. Rhea's entrance translates to insane brutality and violence, while Becky's entrance translates to simply, read my book. Not off to a good start because that attempt at making Becky Lynch exit through the CGI book had some of the worst special effects since modern day Marvel Studios. And with that being said, Rhea Ripley's epic entrance with Motionless and White not only outshined Becky's entrance, but it set her book on fire. And to see both Rhea and Chris Motionless pay tribute to the late great Mitch Lucker with a signature stomp on the stage is a great moment for us metal fans. True story, Rhea does that stomp all the time to pay tribute to the late singer from Suicide Silence. Wait a minute, WWE can launch pyrotechnics for Rhea Ripley's entrance, but not for the opening of WrestleMania itself literally five minutes ago? Motionless! With all due respect to the commentators, when an actual live band is performing an entrance, you shut up until they're done. Trying to enjoy the live music here, we can talk about the fun facts about Motionless and White after the performance. Sorry Becky, but you got outshined simply by the entrance. After that, it all went downhill for the man. And after that epic introduction, it makes Samantha's job a little redundant since, great as she is, there is no way she could top Chris's intro. Even the smallest things get recognition at WrestleMania. These 8K cameras for the introductions are amazing. New era even for cinematography. Let's just be thankful the Prime sponsor in the middle of the ring is not that bright rainbow bottle we saw on SmackDown last month. But all the same, another sin gone, because in-ring canvas sponsorships show excellent business. To anyone complaining about it, why should New Japan get sponsors but WWE shouldn't? They're not the fever hikes are with this particular cold. Ha, ah, get it? Because Becky Lynch is sick and the weather is cold. Ha 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 ha. Nah, not that funny. Year, Rhea's got to be I get that Becky Lynch is sick, but Rhea Ripley is still making a huge mistake by taking her sweet time against the man this early on in the match. Mommy's got to remember that this is the woman who won the first ever women's main event at WrestleMania. Champion Ripley. For those that don't know, Rhea Ripley. Excuse me, let me back up for a moment. You guys back there got a good shot on my back? I had words for my book written on them and thought it'd be cool for me to pose like this for a second. We good to go here? Self, because she does too much! Yeah. 
That looked more like Rhea Ripley was helping Becky Lynch get back on the apron instead of trying to actually do some damage by slamming her on the apron. The Hall of Philadelphia seems to be chanting. I hate to break the news to you, Pat, but the wind has caused WWE to lower the microphones of the audience, and as a result, we can hardly hear the crowds chanting throughout much of WrestleMania Saturday. It's a lot more louder on Sunday because there was hardly any wind. Is it already? Rhea Ripley teased potentially locking in the figure four leg lock, moved around the place, and then ultimately decided to drop Becky's leg and continue stomping on her. Oh, the unfortunate result of having long hair in the wind. I hate it when that happens to me too. I'm gonna get you. Ah, damn it, the hair got blood on my face. Hold on, give me a moment. Six time world champion. I would blame this on the illness, but we know full well that Becky Lynch never jumps off the top rope when she hits the leg drops. And if her concern is injuring herself, why bother doing a top rope leg drop in the first place? Now, many women over the years for Becky Lynch. Because Rhea Ripley was late on her cue, Becky Lynch had to wait in her position, ready to strike with her elbow to a target that wasn't coming. Oh, it was that supposed to be Becky Lynch's version of the zigzag or a backstabber attempt that was misaligned? Regardless, it wasn't that good. Sicknesses don't make one immune to the sins, folks. Just putting that out there, it was her choice to wrestle like this. And Becky. Oh. Okay, maybe wrestling while severely sick was not the best idea on Becky's part. Either that, or Rhea Ripley simply wasn't in the right position at the right time. I win regardless, I'm having fun here. Drive again. With how many times Becky's hand hit the mat, I'm actually surprised that didn't qualify as a submission. I get her intention was to drag herself to the ropes, but her hands keep tapping the mat so many times here. That's a submission in my opinion. Rhea, oh, over the top, missing. Whoa! Whoa! This riptide didn't end up defeating Becky Lynch, but the way Rhea Ripley countered into the move was one of the best I've ever seen. How's that for a WrestleMania moment? That is freaking amazing to see Rhea Ripley continue to keep Becky Lynch in the electric chair position even after getting sent out of the ring like that. The nasty, and now Rhea Ripley! Rhea's First a riptide on the turnbuckle, followed by another one in the middle of the ring. A splendid way for Rhea Ripley to retain the Women's World Championship and continue being champion for over a year. You love to see it. Man, what has happened to Pretty Deadly? All they got coming for them these days is being the team that talks about the tag team ladder match they could have been in. If I were them, I wouldn't be hyping it up at all because it should have been our moment. Also, WWE had to do this to get the ringside area ready for the ladder match when they could have done that on the mandatory 5-minute Peacock commercial break prior to this video package. There are no pinfalls. Whoops, looks like Samantha has got away for the rules of the match because the production team started the entrance for DIY. Until both sets have been retrieved! In other words, WWE is finally undoing the mistake they made back in 2022 by having the tag team titles unified. It's always a satisfying feeling when a mistake is corrected, just like the World Championship situation last year. Because R-Truth continuously mistook DIY as DX, to see Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa take advantage of that with their own version of the DX entrance made it even more hilarious. Welcome back, Awesome Truth. That's all that needs to be said. We're already having a lot of fun and Saturday night has just begun. Poor New Catch Republic, they have been identified as the Awesome Truth as well tonight, so we got two Awesome Truth teams competing in this ladder match, Someone backstage is definitely getting fired for sure. Considering this match is sponsored by Vodka, it might make sense as to why the production team messed up the graphics as well as played DIYs too early. Austin Theory couldn't even have actual pyrotechnics at WrestleMania and still results to non-pyro pyro. What a shame. Damian Priest, always looking like a badass. And Finn Balor, always wearing those masks where you can't see shit and has to be guided to the ring. I told you to stop getting your masks made by Sin Cara. The Judgment Day also gets non-pyro pyro at WrestleMania. Couldn't just launch one piece of fireworks into the sky for them. Get ready for the fireworks. And by that, we mean just the concussion machine. The fireworks are out of commission for reasons unknown. This strategy because it never Finn Balor should be grateful that his head missed the ring post completely despite that being the target. Although, given his history of shoulder problems, let's be hopeful he's not hurt again. That would suck. Also, WWE knows how much I love to yell skip to the advertisements, so they place the logo where I can always see it during the match. You crafty sons of bitches thwarted me for once. Still not gonna save you from a sin though. <laughs> Told me, look at the ring! Quit your cheerleading, Michael Cole. We don't need that anymore. Plus, other teams are dealing with A-Town Down Under, so Kofi Kingston can continue setting up the ladder bridge. Or is this Michael Cole trying to stop me from adding in the ladder bridge cliche? WWE is on a mission to stop me now. Bring it on, I can do this all day. Of course, these superstars all need to unlock the carabiners. Or they could just simply pull down the championships themselves. Why does the golden whatchamacallit have to be taken down in order for it to qualify as a victory? Also, the rules of this match state that it continues until both sets of tag team titles are unhooked. So, what happens if four guys from four different teams unhook each title? 
would that mean we got a new tag team in the making or single tag team champions? I know that Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods intend on knocking over the other two ladders between them, but if they want to unhook either set of tag team titles, they're kind of shit out of luck from this position they're in. On the, rope. the Miz literally grabbed the top rope and jumped off on his own accord, not even having two feet of air time, yet was somehow still affected by the fall. What happened to you, Miz? And, Xavier. and the same can be said for Grayson Waller, who lands on his feet without hitting the ropes, but was somehow hurt so bad that he climbed out of the ring on his own accord and wasn't heard of for the next five minutes. Not a good sell early on here. Staples in his skull from a because Finn Balor missed Tyler Bate completely in that kick, I can only assume Tyler fell over because he lost his balance. Maybe the Prime logo is slippery. Never seen this before. Oh! Funny moment to see Kofi Kingston be on the receiving end of Tyler's airplane spin maneuver, but considering he was watching the whole time, wouldn't Kofi logically duck to avoid the ladder and shove Tyler down, causing both himself and Finn to take a nasty fall? Off of this entire thing. <laughs> Wrestlers on the outside see New Catch Republic climbing the ladders, then realize Pete Dunne didn't have any targets to land on, so they ran to the other side. No. Oh! Oh! Honestly, that was a near perfect shot of the double moonsault from Tyler and Pete. I'll go as far as to remove two cents for of the ladder. Oh my god! Oh! That was both brutal and dangerous. Glad nobody was seriously hurt in that exchange, so I don't feel bad about removing another sin for it. He's in there trying to intercept. Trying to give him a little slap on the ass and said, hey, I'm down here. Pat McAfee is freaking gold on commentary. I'm so happy he's here on the full time. Even though R Truth already did the hot tag sequence at the Royal Rumble earlier this year, it's still hilarious to see him do it again tonight. Although, this was a missed opportunity on WWE's part. Back in the 2016 Royal Rumble match, R Truth brought a ladder to the ring, thinking it was a ladder match. So how fitting would it have been if he threw everyone over the top rope thinking this was a Royal Rumble match? The hot tag was still cool, but dang. He believes this is a tag team match, guys. Well, technically it is. Sure, there are no actual tags, but this is a tag team match involving ladders. So R-Truth isn't entirely wrong here. That one moment when R-Truth got a bigger You Can't See Me reaction than John Cena ever did at WrestleMania. I don't know whether I should add a sin or remove it. Fucking hell, R-Truth is so amazing at everything he does. He makes stupidity look like the greatest thing in the world. Protect that legend at all costs. As delusional as ever, pedigree. Okay, I get that the fairy tale ending is Tommaso Ciampa's finishing move, but it would have been way better if he executed the pedigree like Triple H since they're doing DX moves here. With all due respect, the fairy tale ending was inappropriate in this moment of parody. Even Michael Cole was excited to call the pedigree on commentary. Apology accepted, WWE, for ending the pathetic unification. A-Town Down Under becoming the new SmackDown Tag Team Champions was the perfect moment for that brand. Grayson and Austin are on fire, so this was deserved. Oh no! I guess that's the first time that a newly crowned Tag Team Champion was put through a ladder immediately after winning. More history made at WrestleMania, I suppose. Not at all! There is a table set up outside the ring, yet New Catch Republic chooses to ignore it and hit the Birmingham Hammer in the middle of the ring instead. What a shame. Johnny Wrestling! Oh my god! Holy shit! This is the Johnny Gargano I remember the most from NXT. Not the constantly losing thing. Just the level of extreme he would go to get the job done. Here's to hoping we see more of that in the future because those days in NXT were some of the best we've ever seen. Oh, the devil inside! That's not MJF. Winner of WrestleMania 40 to bring you the first ever women's Money in the Bank ladder match back in 2017. Even if he missed one of the tables, JD McDonough getting what he deserved was a very satisfying moment in this ladder match. Man, how much more awesome is this event going to be? From Senor Money in the Bank. At first I thought Jessica Carr was starting to become an actual part of storylines by stopping Damian Priest from climbing the ladder, before realizing the ladder he's climbing is broken and in danger of costing lives. Listen to the refs, folks. Seriously, Damian Priest is taking his time ascending the ladder to retrieve the Raw Tag Team Championship, knowing full well there are five other teams more than willing to stop him. Plus, JD McDonough got taken out of the equation, so what are you waiting for? Oh no, wait for a south of heaven! And failed miserably. He at least got the Miz down from the ladder, but the south of heaven was botched. Does. This is a very heartwarming moment because R Truth finally gets his WrestleMania moment for the first time in his whole career. The Awesome Truth are the new Raw Tag Team Champions, and it's so satisfying to see. So far, great start to WrestleMania 40. And if that wasn't great enough, WrestleMania 40 also has the epic return of the beach ball, but done in a way of celebration, not out of boredom. You'll love to see it. 
I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't into the idea of having Dominic Mysterio get involved with his father again for the second year in a row, because this time his involvement with the Legado del Fantasma vs LWO feud was far too random and unnecessary. Just a, hey, I'm here moment compared to something worth being involved in. To this day, I still don't understand why Dominic was involved after not being in Rey Mysterio's feuds for almost a full year. Also, justice for Carlito, replaced by Dragon Lee at Survivor Series against Santos Escobar, never eliminated in the Royal Rumble match, and now this. Dragon Lee was chosen once again over Carlito, then Dragon got attacked and was replaced by Andrade instead. Carlito just can't seem to catch a break or be in a great moment since returning to WWE last year. But of course, Michael Cole won't be unbiased because Dominic Mysterio is involved in the match. What else is new? Corey Graves is struggling to come up with excuses to defend Dominic Mysterio and running out of them fast. Very cringe if you ask me. Indeed, because Rey Mysterio was involved in the match, the sponsor must be a food or beverage. We had Cinnamon Toast Crunch, then Pizza Hut, and now Minute Maid. Damn, even in the background, you can see Carlito's look of frustration. Guarantee he was the one who attacked Dragon Lee just so he could be involved in the match at WrestleMania, yet still was denied the chance. At this point, Rey Mysterio deserves to get beat down if it happens because he's starting to make enemies on purpose here. To that guy with the busted open 24 hours every day in 2024 sign, I seriously hope you're referring to the radio show. Otherwise, how the hell are you still alive from all that blood loss? And here comes Andrade. What Andrade probably did not know is Dominic Mysterio secretly had a protective vest underneath his ring gear to protect himself against those chops. And the cold weather too. From the Double team since For Santos Escobar throws himself out of the ring and then Dominic Mysterio runs forward so that he can get hit by his own partner because reasons. That was a very creative double cross body from both Andrade and Rey Mysterio. So far a great start to the match despite a few odd bumps here and there. Oh, Still locking in. Yeah. You know what I find odd? The referee is warning Rey that he will get disqualified if he uses the belt against Dominic, yet last year when Rey used the belt against him, nobody gave a damn. And just like the match last year, this one also has disqualifications. Also, if the argument can be said that using the belt is legal due to it being part of Rey's ring gear, then does that make it pointless for the referee to warn of an impending disqualification? I am so confused here. They changed the rules week by week. Tag me. Dominic yells at the referee to make sure he sees the tag to prevent me from calling out an illegal tag sin. Y'all get a pass this time, but I'm on to you, WWE. You have to wonder how the guts oh, no. The referee starts counting the pinfall despite the obvious fact that Santos Escobar is not even trying to pin Rey Mysterio. Magic. Mysterio. Santos Escobar is a dick to his own partner as he waited until Dominic was standing in that position before throwing Ray into him. What an asshole, am I right? Ray is a tag team tonight. Cover. Oh god, this match has a lot of miscues, botches, referees being incompetent, and now a messed up pinfall that can't count for anything because Ray's shoulder is off the canvas. Did this match seriously have to be on the WrestleMania card? Because we could have done without it. Shoulders down now. Andrade has poor timing because if Ray did not kick out of the pin, he never would have made it in time to break it up before it was too late. Attempted mask ripping. Moonsault lands on his Even if Andrade landed on the canvas before he ever connected with Dominic on the second moonsault, it's still amazing to see him do that double moonsault maneuver when his opponents move out of the way. Good to see him back in WWE. What? Escobar! Santos Escobar is amazing with his timing. Shame that it took literally the whole match before the good stuff happened, but hey, I'm smiling in the end. The only reason Electra Lopez got up on the apron was because she was bored and wanted to fight with Zelina Vega to pass the time. We're security! We're in the Eagles Stadium, so of course we gotta have some Eagles representation, but I still feel that this was unnecessarily random. And that's when I realized the entire point of this match was just so Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson could make a cameo for the hometown crowd. Not as good as other times when football players get involved with WWE. That was the weirdest pinfall ever because Ray literally spun Santos all over the ring. Even the referee had to readjust his position just to continue seeing the shoulders down. Real brothers will battle. Michael Cole just broke a massive rule, which is to keep the kayfabe alive at all costs. He had to emphasize the term real brothers because The Undertaker and Kane have faced off twice at WrestleMania and are not actually the Brothers of Destruction. Also, we've had brother versus brother matches every 15 years at WrestleMania since the 10th edition. Brett versus Owen, Matt versus Jeff, and now Jay versus Jimmy. Place your predictions right now on which two brothers will fight each other at WrestleMania 55 in 2039. Also, also, I'd be more excited for this feud between the Usos had they touched base on it for a majority of the last eight months. 
But unfortunately, Jimmy turned on Jay, then they moved on from each other for five months, had a minor confrontation in the Royal Rumble match, and then didn't start feuding again until WrestleMania was on the horizon. Made this almost entirely forgettable. I am my brother's keeper. I won't lie, despite the forgettable buildup, the one thing I enjoyed is the video package to hype up the Usos match. It was well done and almost emotional. I'll take a sin off for that, but it sucks that this might be the only part of the feud that gets a sin taken off the counter. I choose to run with greatness. By being the literal fly on the wall when it comes to that greatness. Hell, Solo Sokoa had lost pretty much every match since defeating John Cena at Crown Jewel last year, yet even he still looks more great than Jimmy Uso at this stage. Boy, I hope I don't get canceled for saying this to Lil Wayne's horrible performance. Nah, I'm just kidding, I don't give a damn. Skip! And apparently, neither does WWE. It's a pre-match assault, but sadly, it's also the only cool thing about this long-awaited match between Jay and Jimmy Uso. Jimmy's born a, about a minute earlier. Like nine minutes to be exact. Pat McAfee will be great at CinemaSins 2 expansion. Was just about to say that myself. Word for word. It tears the family apart. But it only tore the family apart because the Usos failed to tear the house down with this match. Plus, maybe adding Solo Sokoa to be involved in some way could have added leverage. Just a little suggestion on my part. That they would headline WrestleMania never expected it to be against one another. Well, then the family can breathe a sigh of relief knowing the Usos are not headlining WrestleMania 40 against each other. And Jimmy Uso. Oh, nice. Neckbreaker. That Samoan drop attempt was botched so badly, even Michael Cole was confused and thought it was Jay Uso countering Jimmy Uso with a neckbreaker. We are really not cooking with this match whatsoever, are we? This is your brother. Jimmy Uso wasting precious time taunting Jay Uso and asking the crowd if this is seriously who they like. The match has already been in a traffic jam since the start, but at least try to make it semi-entertaining. I'm begging you at this point. The confidence to break oh. It's known that wrestlers slap their bodies to make the sound effects for slaps, but in this case, the slap was off sync with the actual punch that was nowhere near Jay's face. The sponsor for this match is Dude Wipes, and personally, I just want to wipe my ass with this match because of how shit it is. And that sucks because I was looking forward to this clash between the Usos. Maybe their best performances are truly in tag team action after all. Oh, the blood oh. line. That super kick was hit with so much velocity that it destroyed the LED boards on the ring and at ringside. Also, the remaining five minutes of this match is nothing but endless super kicks. I also wanted to see a crossover match with the Young Bucks, but after watching this, I'd rather not see a match where it's just endless super kicks over and over. Here are five more sins, honestly. Not only does the remaining minutes of this match have endless super kicks, but quite a number of them miss their targets completely, which makes it even worse. That one moment when the only entertaining thing about this brother versus brother match is the audience chanting yeet and no yeet with the back and forth punches. I feel so let down after this match ended. Big shame. The last two minutes of this match is Jay Uso constantly super kicking Jimmy Uso, yelling about how much they're brothers, Jimmy begging for mercy, and Jay hitting the final blow. Spear! Jay Uso may want to reconsider using Roman Reigns' spear because from that angle, it looked more like a clothesline to the midsection than it did an actual spear. Leave the spears to the tribal chief. No yeet for that. Maybe Cody will celebrate tonight. Why would Cody Rhodes celebrate tonight? He's not fighting Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship until tomorrow night. And even if he won tonight in the tag team match, there'd still be no reason to celebrate as he needs to conserve energy for tomorrow's title match. WWE shows the cameras approaching the stage, which makes one think someone is about to make their entrance, but we're just fooling you, even if April Fools was a week ago. Damage control. You can just see how frustrated Bianca Belair truly is at having to continue feuding with damage control, even though she's conquered them so many times since 2022. And I really don't blame her, because this match shouldn't have to exist at WrestleMania, but it does just for an excuse to get the names on the match card. More filler. Also, despite the fact that it was Naomi who set this whole thing up at the first place, Bianca Belair is getting the full credit for the six-woman tag existing, making Naomi a side piece of the match. Loving the Japanese entrance, but it kind of makes Dakota Kai feel like the odd woman out since she is not Japanese. This is cold, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's your own fault if you didn't properly dress for the occasion. Same goes for everyone else who attended WrestleMania 40 yet still cried about the cold. Your fault, haha. -ha. Jade Cargill, Naomi, and Bianca Belair, not gonna lie, look like a trio of badasses up there on the podium for their entrance. That was awesome to look at. I'm on my own. Okay, the entrance on the podium was looking cool at first, but they switched from music to music so fast that nobody except Bianca Belair has time to pose for the audience before it's over. And why couldn't they just use one of their themes for the whole thing? Or maybe a new theme just for tonight so one doesn't outshine the other. That one moment when Damage Control dance into Bianca Belair's music was far more entertaining than their opponent's actual entrance. Ouch. 
Fights has never won at this event. And that's the sin. Because of how dominant Asuka was in NXT, being undefeated for over two years, and putting on great performances every time, WWE should have made her the female Undertaker at WrestleMania with the undefeated streak. But alas, we don't have that, and every time I'm reminded that Asuka remains winless at WrestleMania, it saddens me. Elfia is feeling the glow. Naomi runs toward Kyrie Sane, but then slows down and hardly connects her dropkick in the corner. So much for a potential brutal moment. The most wins by a woman in WrestleMania history. The fact that the highest amount of times any female has won a match at WrestleMania is four times is both shocking and sad at the same time. Corner, and she oh. Wow, that was actually an innovative counter on the part of Naomi to both Dakota Kai and Kairi Sane. Good enough to remove another sin from the total. And Bianca showing her power. Oh great, now we're going to hear another rant from Ryback after Bianca Belair starting marching around the ring like he did. It was cool to see Jade Cargill competing at WrestleMania. Unfortunately, using her for only the last two minutes of the match wasn't really something I'd do. It'd be nice to see her compete longer than she did while part of AEW, just saying. <laughs> Wrestler accidentally hits their own partner cliche, or in this case, sprays the mist in their partner's eyes. Down she marches around the ring! Down she marches around the ring. And that's what happens when one predicts what's about to happen too early. Maybe you need a Hi. Snickers. Hi. Maybe The Miz needs a Skippers, or maybe I need a Snickers because I absolutely suck at this now. Nah, I'm just kidding. Fuck the Snickers. I'm better than before. That's the attitude to have in any situation we're in. That's strange. Chad Gable isn't in this match, despite the hashtag we want Gable trending on social media after Sami Zayn beat him to earn this Intercontinental Championship match against Gunther. Huh, that usually works, I've been told. Just to end up on the shoulder of the longest reigning champion. I mean, yeah, the Intercontinental Championship would kind of have to make it to your shoulder if you are to become the longest reigning champion. Gunther says it as though he was already the longest reigning champion before the title landed on the shoulder. Mr. Perfect, Roddy Piper, then Rick Rue. To see Gunther go through the rich history of the Intercontinental Championship really adds into the prestige, in addition to the amount of respect Gunther himself had put into the title. It's absolutely amazing to watch. I am afraid, okay? On one side, you got Gunther keeping the prestige of the Intercontinental Championship alive, and on the other side, you got Sami Zayn admitting he's afraid of letting everybody down because he doesn't believe he could beat Gunther. Now that is a fantastic storyline. If there's anything that deserves the praise in WWE recently, it's these one-shot camera scenes that follow the wrestlers from point A to point B, meeting several other people along the way. Feels even more realistic, and you can feel the emotion from the wrestlers more than ever before. Digging this new era so far. Skip! Drink Prime though, but still, skip! Kaiser from Germany, this man from Austria. And still, Giovanni Vinci gets no love. Not from Imperium, not from Pat McAfee, and not from the WWE. We're the fictional Rocky. This is fictional? <laughs> Pat McAfee is hilarious just by trying to justify Rocky Balboa as a real life character, which he is, from a certain point of view. There's a striking resemblance to Ivan Drago. Corey Graves couldn't be any more wrong. For one thing, Gunther is not even Russian and doesn't have the facial expressions of Ivan Drago. And for the other, he's not blonde. This is not a movie. This is reality. Well, I mean, who says it can't be both a movie and reality? After all, these matches have predetermined outcomes, just like a movie, actors, just like a movie, and it's played out in real time like a reality show. That is WWE for you. It was June 10th, 2022. This is honestly the first time we heard a commentator mention the exact date Gunther won the Arcanal Championship, which basically translates to he's obviously losing tonight, so let's say the date for everyone to remember. Well, you gotta survive. How funny would it be if Gunther hesitated to chop Sami Zayn because the latter ducked in cover only to turn himself around and chop Sami Ray in the back. I know Gunther's not into comedy, but that still would have been cool. How bright that is. Gunther hesitated once again. What is it with Gunther hesitating to chop his opponents now? If he didn't hesitate, he would have connected with Sammy before the latter escaped. I know that Gunther likes to take his time with his opponents, but has anyone else noticed the one match where he actually loses is the one where he wastes valuable time taunting and walking around like he's Roman Reigns on a monthly basis? Perhaps your best strategy. Uh oh, Sami Zayn tapped out without Gunther doing anything. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a fun Intercontinental Championship match. Good night, everyone. I'm just kidding. Could you imagine if that counted? Punishing Gunther yeah. like this, but he's been doing that oh, again. Wow. Holy shit. Gunther performed an amazing counter of the Blue Thunder Bomb right into his sleeper hold. It's awesome to see that he's not just powerful, but also quick at the same time. Gunther's not gonna allow. And a German. Even something as simple as a German suplex gets a center mover, because Gunther knew Sami Zayn was about to reach the ropes and quickly switch things up to prevent it. Excellent ring awareness. Usually somebody just tries to keep the submission locked in and hope for the best. Up Sami Zayn. Who kicks 
You can clearly see Gunther preparing to spring himself off of Sami Zayn before Sami could ever kick out. That's how you knew the match wasn't going to end just yet. Oh, God. Oh, God. Copyright infringement, and yet it somehow goes over the commentators' heads that Gunther hit Sami Zayn with his own halluva kick. And that was an amazing halluva kick from Sami Zayn. Went after Gunther before the latter could even notice what was happening. It didn't finish the match for Sami, but you still love to see it. Gunther never taunts anyone's family at ringside during matches, yet the one time he actually does is the one match where he loses the Intercontinental Championship. I hate to say it, but 666 days of being a dominant champion ended because of Gunther being a stupid idiot. Eddie, I don't care what Sammy's telling you! You gotta love it when the commentators get into the action the way they are now, yelling at the referee to call off the match for the sake of Sami Zayn's health. Man, I am loving this new era of WWE. Sammy trying to fire up! It turns out, in order to stay alive in the match, all Sami Zayn had to do was channel his inner Hulk Hogan and start hulking up for the fans to get excited. Really makes you wonder why everybody doesn't do this then. The top rope, Sammy! Look, I can understand the determination to stay in the match, but Sami Zayn got hit with several clotheslines, three power bombs, and two splashes all in a row. And we just reached no selling territory by having him get back up from all of that. While I did have my concerns for Sammy potentially no-selling all that destruction from Gunther, I loved the way the match ended. Bringing back that brain buster on the turnbuckle, followed by two more halluva kicks, and the ring general has been conquered at WrestleMania. What a moment Sami Zayn absolutely deserved. I'll take out 10 more sins. Has won the big one! Well, technically this is not the big one, because it's not a world championship. But also, this is Sami Zayn's fourth time winning the Intercontinental Championship. Not trying to ruin the mood here, but I'm just saying. Time to show a recap of what happened an hour and a half ago because... Reasons. Seriously, what went down in the tag team match with the Mysterios has no impact on the immediate future of WrestleMania 40. Not even going into Sunday. We just running out of things to advertise around here or something? Color me surprised. Announcing the attendance for tonight's WrestleMania apparently requires both Adam Pearce and Nick Aldis to be here. What, are we afraid one of them is going to say the false number while the other says the real number? WrestleMania with their exaggerated numbers as usual. This stadium is not even capable of holding 70,000 people, much less 72,000. And that's even with the floor being available. I don't know if you guys noticed, but not only is WWE showing the matches set to take place tomorrow night, but they actually show the matches in order of when they are scheduled to take place. And to be honest, I like that. We know what's coming up next before it actually happens. I'm taking a five cents right now as a congratulations to all these wrestlers. They managed to take a moment of legitimate backlash from the fan base and turn it into this epic feud leading into the main event of WrestleMania Saturday. This makes the main event for tomorrow even more exciting because of all the insane amounts of pressure at stake. Also, we can finally say that Seth Rollins has been in the official main event of WrestleMania. While he pulled off the heist of the century nearly 10 years ago, holy fuck, almost 10 years ago? The official main event of that show was Brock Lesnar vs. Roman Reigns. Plus, Seth doesn't count it himself, so it's more official than what we think. Congratulations. Also, also, this is more history in the making because never before has the main event of both nights at WrestleMania featured two of the same names. Not to mention, this is the first time in WrestleMania history that the last three main events feature the same two names. Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes last year, in this tag match, and in tomorrow's main event. So much history put in place from just one tag team match. Another five cents removed from the counter. In the biggest main event of WrestleMania. Oddly enough, The Rock wasn't entirely wrong when he mentioned that, because Rock and Roman Reigns end up being part of the biggest main event in WrestleMania history. Just not the way he envisioned it. Does that mean the Cody Crybabies both won and lost? This is bullsh. Says the guy who willingly gave up his spot for The Rock without a shadow of a doubt. It doesn't make sense for him to call this bullshit if he's the sole reason this happened in the first place. It is not your right to determine the main event. And once again, you willingly said that you wouldn't fight Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 40, so why are you complaining about The Rock taking the stand in the main event of WrestleMania? Cody Rhodes' complaint makes a whole lot less sense the more you think about it. It was a good thing he changed his mind for the better, but it really makes you wonder why he didn't just say no to The Rock in the first place. So many flaws in this plan here. They'd be ashamed of you. Roman Reigns and The Rock get upset that Cody Rhodes mentioned their dead grandfathers, completely ignoring the fact that they just called out Cody's dead father and called him irrelevant. Acknowledge us! Roman Reigns says acknowledge us after years of just saying acknowledge me, which basically confirms that he always looked at the other members of the bloodline as lesser than him, except for The Rock. Little Dick Syndrome! One thing we gotta love is Cody Rhodes was an absolute savage, almost on the rock levels of savagery. 
further confirming he's the right threat against Roman Reigns on the Universal Championship. Gotta love how everyone thought The Rock was too washed up to be involved in WrestleMania and at the moment where everyone doubted him, he turned into literally the biggest heel in WWE within days. The final boss just might be the best version of The Rock's character we've ever seen. When you with the final boss! The fact that The Rock doesn't give a literal fuck about the rules of the PG rating. This entire buildup is fucking insane and fucking amazing. And I'm saying fuck way too many times here, aren't I? It's a great entrance as usual for Cody Rhodes, but damn, the pyrotechnics were out of sync from the actual noise. Also, holy shit, we might be setting yet another record at WrestleMania. It takes over 20 minutes of entrances for these four wrestlers. Most of the time it's great, but damn, we have more than enough time for a bathroom break and a lunch break before the match begins. Careful Cody, there are a lot of Prime haters out there who more than likely turned on you because they hate Logan Paul on a personal level despite not knowing him. And then, as Seth Rollins is on his way to the ring, someone sneaks up behind him and steps on his long-ass robe, causing him to trip and fall over. See his hat's on his shoulder! That's a hat! I'm with Corey Graves on this one. I have no idea what to make of that object on Seth Rollins' shoulder. Someone help me out here on what that is. Final boss, engaged. Everything about The Rock's entrance before his actual music hits is bone-chilling. The electricity, the video games references, and even when his music does hit, the Brahma Bowl made out of fire. This deserves 10 cents taken off the counter. Boy, that's gotta suck for WWE's actual championship belts when a personalized title made exclusively for The Rock by Muhammad Ali's folks looks 10 times better than the official ones. It's a great title, but I'm adding a sin because of being reminded of how much a lot of WWE's titles look like crap. In addition to calling himself the final boss, The Rock went to Asgard and ordered Thor to shoot his lightning on the crowd. Or it could have been Loki in disguise. Defeat a guy in six seconds, and we're holding that against him? I'm with Pat McAfee on this one. Defeating anyone in just under 10 seconds at WrestleMania should be considered a major accomplishment, not a weakness. Michael Cole is just trying to channel the IWC by being negative about everything. What I'm honestly going to remove another sin for is Roman Reigns competing twice at WrestleMania this weekend. A lot of fans had said, based on his track record, that Roman would never compete in both main events, and yet here we are. This event really feels like proving some fans wrong and giving the other fans what they want. If you can sit at home for two months, I'd get six pack abs like that as well. Yet Michael Cole hasn't had a match in well over 12 years and he still doesn't have those six pack abs he claims. What are you complaining about, dude? Pat McAfee and Corey Graves are hilarious. It's weird how they went from hating each other at the Royal Rumble to being besties acknowledging the tribal chief at WrestleMania. Long term storytelling. Advertising brands on the LED boards are fine, however, could you potentially dim the lights, please? The result of turning off the spotlights on the audience is causing the white light to be brighter than usual and it's a little distracting. Let's get it on! <laughs> That's what she said! So this nearly one hour match begins with everyone standing in the ring, meaning everyone is the legal man, correct? Knowing how much The Rock takes over with the rules, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Has earned him the right! Even The Rock looked to his left thinking, who the hell was tapping on their microphone? That's distracting the final boss. The referee just stands around doing absolutely nothing, not even trying to get each team to choose one member to start the match. And this is before The Rock gets on his ass about the rules of the tag team match as well. And here we go. It takes nearly four minutes of this 45 minute match before the first actual lockup takes place. At times, I wonder if they're just trying to intentionally stall the match so that they can claim they went through a grueling 45 minute match. Wait, number of matches against... One shoulder tackle means it's time for another full minute of posing around. We gotta ensure this match goes to 45 minutes by any means necessary. Pose up, bitches! Tagging in Cody Rhodes apparently requires an endless amount of times worth of buildup and hype to the crowd. Hopefully having the odds in your favor. Now that we mention it, this whole thing was a lose-lose situation for Roman Reigns regardless. The result of this match will either make tomorrow's main event without the bloodline involved and Roman shit out of luck for help. Or it's anything goes, and all enemies of Roman's past come back to take him out. Damn, the bloodline backed themselves in the corner by their own terms when you think more about it. <laughs> Seth Rollins tries to tag himself in, but accidentally taps Roman Reigns instead, making it null and void. Oof. And for the first time- Just goes to show that no matter how much The Rock pissed off the fans a few months ago, nobody can ever stay mad at the final boss, because he's the freaking Rock. Flying by The Rock as he exploded- Boy, you can't help but love when The Rock tells you to just bring it. His way of telling Cody Rhodes to tag into the match so they can settle the score. Cause he loves the business. Maybe he has a massive ego. I can't believe I'd be saying this in 2024, but fuck Michael Cole. His annoying ass kissing of the baby faces is reaching 2011 levels of annoyance when he was kissing the asses of the heels. Why wouldn't you have a massive ego if you're the biggest star? That's what I'm saying! On the WWE, the... 
Ah. What about this business needs saving? According to the over-obsessed fans of AEW, everything needs to be saved because they're in some sort of the war or something. I don't know. They lost me after the word everything. All right, guys, it was cool when the match began, but we are basically 10 minutes into the match now. Can we knock it off with the stare downs? At this rate, everybody has had a turn to stare at each other in the last 10 minutes. Seth Rollins gets his revenge on Logan Paul by knocking over all the prime bottles at ringside. I guess any chance to get back at Logan Paul is a good one, according to Seth. Rumor has it that Seth Rollins demanded a share of the royalties when he drank prime and spat it into the Rock's face. I don't fuck around. Okay, you count, okay. you're fired. That actually doesn't make any sense when you think about it. The rules of a referee state that, no matter who's in charge, he must be an unbiased referee that has the ultimate authority of a match. Chad Patton can't be fired for correctly doing his job, because then he can sue The Rock's ass. I don't think Rock gets how wrestling matches work. The Rock Chad Whoever's in charge of the censor mutes are definitely getting fired. They censored The Rock saying fuck five seconds too late. And also, this is a premium live event. Who cares if they swear? Finally! Fucking finally! We have a split screen to show both fights taking place at the same time. I've been begging for this to be a thing for years. Five sins immediately taken off for WWE finally listening to me. Rock's head off a ring. Aw, come on. Put the split screen back where I'm putting the five sins back. You just wanted to get my hopes up before throwing it back in my face, didn't you? Very well, then. You know, this would have been the perfect opportunity for Atta Johnson over there to actually get involved herself and trip Seth Rollins off the barricade. I can't be the only one who was actually waiting for her to grab Seth's leg, right? The link tonight. What the hell are you doing? When you got the rock laid out in the ring, you don't stand outside the ring and taunt him. You get yourself back in the ring and continue the onslaught. Unless Seth wants his team to lose his match on purpose as a form of revenge for Cody Rhodes embarrassing him three times in a row. Right. What's the point of the rock distracting the referee so that Roman Reigns could attack Seth Rollins? He threatened to fire the referee if he started doing countouts, but he's afraid of disqualifications possibly being a thing? Also, if the rock didn't want this match to end with a disqualification or countout, couldn't he have just used his authority powers and made the tag team match bloodline rules? Or simply a no holds barred match? Because that's literally what we're getting here tonight. This. this is an actual fact. Throughout both nights of WrestleMania 40, Seth Rollins was dealing with a torn meniscus. So to see him suck it up and go through with the two matches he competes in, he deserves all the respect. Here are 10 sins taken off. That's a moose. Tag, man. Since The Rock can just change the rules of the match on the fly, what is the point of doing tags anymore? Everyone can just fight at once and the referee wouldn't do anything about it because The Rock threatened to fire him. Barking at everybody. The Rock is addicted to Seth Rollins. By Seth, Seth with an opportunity. Cody Rhodes sees where Roman Reigns got thrown out of the ring, and his first instinct is to move to that exact position so that Roman can stop a tag from being made. If only Cody stayed where he was, Seth would have successfully tagged out. He loses tonight! Cody Cutter! Either Cody Rhodes overshot the Cody Cutter, or Roman Reigns was way too close since the move wasn't executed properly. Decide amongst yourselves which one gets the sin. Undisputed champion! Whoa, and yeah, it doesn't have the same impact compared to when the actual music is playing. Second Cody Cutter in a row that wasn't executed properly. Not been as night so far for Cody Cutters. I hate that damn song! Paul Heyman is fucking hilarious with that one line alone. Pull the official out of the damn- Of course, it's a referee getting knocked over at the crucial point of the match cliche, but come on, you mean to tell me that a very slow drag and a calm collapse to the floor is enough to knock out this referee for even two minutes? Just for tomorrow. I gotta say, that was an awesome curb stomp to break the guillotine chokehold. You don't often see Seth Rollins do curb stomps to someone's face, but in the circumstances they were in, it had to be done. Loving this. We might as well just have bloodline rules for this match tonight. Michael Cole would be great at CinemaSins 2 expansion. Now Cody's got the white belt! But instead of immediately hitting The Rock with it, Cody Rhodes chooses to hype it up, which inevitably allows Rock to counter. Sure, The Rock jumped in the air before Cody Rhodes could connect the Cody Cutter, but that was a better execution than both the attempts on Roman Reigns. Plus, that was a great way to counter the people's elbow as well. Roman Reigns hitting the spear on The Rock was the greatest thing to happen in this match, and with it being an accident, made it even better. The way the crowd reacted to that amazing moment adds into the momentum. Let's go. What do you bet Seth Rollins is thinking, is this guy serious? He doesn't even have his hands locked for the pedigree, which ends up being the reason why Cody's pedigree did not affect the rock for the win. The referee counts with both his arms despite these two facts. Roman's shoulder was off well into the first count, and even then, The Rock is the only legal competitor. So counting Roman's shoulders doesn't mean squat even if Roman didn't kick out. 
It's a good thing Seth Rollins stopped The Rock. It was either that or the announce table would break prematurely, since that seems to be a crazy trend with The Rock trying to hit rock bottoms through announce tables. Just ask Mick Foley and CM Punk. <laughs> Copy rock infringement. And also, you went through the wrong table. This war is freaking amazing. We are 40 minutes into the match and I don't even want it to end. That's just how damn good it is. This doesn't make sense. Cody Rhodes throws the rock back into the ring, gets into the ring himself, and then leans back out over the edge of the apron just so Roman Reigns could hit the drive-by kick. Did he need to throw up for a moment? Seriously, we were doing so good with the carnage and now we're going to do the monologuing again? Come on, we're over 40 minutes into the match at this point. Cody Rhodes hits two consecutive crossroads on Roman Reigns and then chooses to back up as far as possible just so he can get hit by The Rock's belt. That's the second time tonight he intentionally put himself in the please hit me position. Also, after the big defeat at WrestleMania 39, one would think that Cody Rhodes would not dare back up too much when hitting all those crossroads on his opponent because it would be too much of a risk. Foreshadowing tomorrow night. Michael Cole immediately thinks that Cody Rhodes has no chance against Roman Reigns tomorrow simply because it's anything goes and bloodline rules, ultimately forgetting that Roman Reigns has more enemies than he has allies. Think optimistically, mate. However, I gotta take off 10 more sins because this was the perfect way to set up tomorrow's main event and it shut up the haters who claimed The Rock was too exhausted to compete that one time he brawled with Jinder Mahal. Now Rock put on a 45 minute match and did more than just rock bottoms and people's elbows. Never underestimate The Rock.